Okay, good evening and welcome to our final virtual Medea Manufacturing Meetup uh, for our March Manufacturing Week. Hope you're all safe and well. I'm Bruce Lathrop, a member of the Medea Board, and we'll be introducing our presenters. But first, I wanted to thank Brenda Trainer, who will be helping with this meetup, and I think Jeanette will also be helping, although I need to make her a co-host maybe. Brenda will be moderating the chat and live questions. Our presenters will be answering questions after their presentation. For those unfamiliar with Zoom, you can click on the chat at, at the bottom of the screen to enter your questions. Brenda or Jeanette will be reviewing the chat and questions so that the presenters can respond to them. The presenters will also be taking live questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and you, uh, we'll call on you and you can ask your questions. Before we start the presentation, I wanted to say a little bit about Medea. We're a 501c3 educational organization centered at the heart of San Gabriel Valley in California. And our mission is to ensure the region's technical, scientific, and industrial workforce are connected and have the tools they need to be successful by providing educational programs on entrepreneurship, business finance and operations, and technology development and commercialization, all in settings which encourage networking and collaboration among members. Our next meeting will be April 14th, and the topic and presenter will be announced soon. If you have any feedback on this program or ideas for future programs, please send your comments and suggestions to email at mediatech.org. After we're done with the presentation, we'll be uh, continuing networking, and you can grab your favorite beverage and join us. I'll now turn to introducing our presenters. Thomas Mee is chairman and CEO of Mee Industries, Inc. Thomas has 38 years experience with fog system design, manufacturing, project execution, and research and development. He has also authored and co-authored many articles and several peer-reviewed papers on the subject of gas turbine inlet fogging and water atomization. And he, and he holds two US patents relating to gas turbine fogging. Uh, DRC Me, or not DRC, Darcy Me Sloan is president of Me Industries and has been with the company for over 40 years. Her focus is on the financial marketing and business management of uh, the industries. So please welcome Thomas and Darcy. Nice to see you all. So shall I get started? Yes, go ahead. All right. First of all, thanks for inviting us to do this. And thank everyone for coming to listen to a little story about our little company. <laughs> so uh, first off, what is a fog system? To us, a fog system is a high pressure water atomizer that um, produces a fog of water droplets that are similar in size to a natural cloud. And it was actually originally developed to be like that, to be like a natural cloud. But the uh, cloud produces much denser than typically would occur in nature, uh, about an order of magnitude denser. So you can see it's seven in long. the photo we're testing uh, a nozzle grid on our parking lot, and uh, you can't see very deep into it. Visibility is uh, around about a meter in good light conditions. A little history about Me Industries. It was founded by my father and Darcy's father, Thomas Mead Jr. I'm the third. <laughs> and uh, he was a meteorologist and a, specifically a cloud physicist. So he studied cloud particles and how they form and how they react in nature. And originally the company built meteorological instrumentation. You can see some photos of them there. Things like uh, cloud particle replicators and ice nucleating particle counters, things you would put in an airplane and fly through a cloud and collect meteorological data. And the company also did research uh, for the US federal government and for others. And one project they had was fog uh, cloud seeding. So I was only 10 years old at the time, but I think that was the beginning of uh, direct pressure fogging 
technology. Our father was looking for a way to produce a water fog that had droplet sizes similar to natural clouds so that you could uh, spray whatever chemicals they were that would make the, the cloud uh, rain where it might otherwise have not rained. This is the original fog patent filed in 1970. Environment control method and apparatus. And some of the applications my father was thinking about was cooling outdoor areas or a fog of water droplets essentially opaque to infrared to cover crops to prevent frost protection. So as a meteorologist, he understood that if you, that on a, on a clear night, on a clear spring night, for example, there's a great risk of crop damage due to uh, frost, basically. And that's because when there's no cloud cover, radiation can leave the ground, radiate back to deep space and the ground can cool quite quickly. So by covering it with a blanket of fog, it would be an effect uh, similar to the greenhouse effect. It keeps the planet warm. And uh, so that was one of the early applications he thought about. And another was a visible cloud is provided for decorative effect, what we call special effects today. And that's the uh, house we grew up in. <laughs> with the first fog system in the backyard sometime around 1968, probably. And the photo on the right is the uh, original corporate headquarters of me industries, a carriage house above a garage, also in Altadena, California. There were uh, as many as 14 employees working in that small building when we were kids. So it was, it was quite interesting growing up around a actual functioning company. There was a uh, electronic shop downstairs in the back, a full machine shop with lathes and milling machines for making those instruments and uh, a lot of inter interesting stuff being done. The first big fog project was for the Pepsi-Cola company for their pavilion at the World's Fair in Osaka, Japan in 1970. And the concept was conceived by a Japanese artist who coincidentally was the daughter of a famous Japanese meteorologist who studied snowflakes. <laughs> so her father studied snow and my father studied clouds. So that project uh, occurred in 1970. It was a big geodesic dome structure. You can see part of it poking out of the top there. It was covered with... Uh, an artificial cloud, basically just for effect. And the artist who did that, Fuchiko Nakaya, oh, first of all, this is a photo of the uh, inside of that dome, which had a really groovy three-dimensional mirror. <laughs> so if you've ever looked, if you ever looked in a spherical mirror, your uh, image appears to be inverted and floating in space. So that was 1970s Osaka. And Fujiko Nakaya has continued to do what she calls fog sculpture art. This is the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, which I think was done about 10 years ago. And we're currently working on a project with her. Uh, Darcy would know more about that than I do. In China. But we've done, um, pardon? The project is in China. In China. So we've done projects all over the world with her over the past 50 years. And uh, she's in her 80s now, but we knew her when we were children. In fact, she taught us how to eat with chopsticks. <laughs> That's the first uh, frost protection system, or one of the early ones. That, I believe, was uh, Wagner Ranch in Yuma, Arizona. It was about a 200-acre citrus grove. You can't see the orange trees because they're underneath the cloud there. So this is a long nozzle line with multiple atomizing nozzles on it. There was a pumping station with large uh, high pressure pumps. And it creates a cloud that uh, basically covers the entire orchard. And it has, it has the uh, greenhouse effect where it re-radiates radiation, but it also, if that's not enough to keep the crop cool, 
the small droplets begin to freeze onto the fruit or onto the blossoms, which are the tender part of the fruit at that point. And something called a latent heat of fusion warms them up. So you can keep them, for, you can keep uh, orange blossoms from suffering damage by continually freezing water on it. But if you did that with a lot of water, you'd overwhelm the tree and it would, it would break from the ice. So the fog was a good way of doing that. This is our current facility and headquarters. It's an old uh, Aerojet building built back in the 50s, maybe. Aerojet was famous for um, liquid, uh, sorry, uh, solid rocket propellants that were strapped on the wings of airplanes to assist them in takeoff. So they uh, became a very big company in the Second World War because they were, the military application was, was big. And that shows a uh, test at the Aerojet facility in the 1940s. So that's probably somewhere around our current day factory. So the technology, it's basically water atomization. We pump water up to high pressure, 1,000 to 2,000 PSI which is about 20 to 40 times the pressure in the pipes in your house. The water is then forced to a very small orifice. It's about 150 microns in diameter, so roughly a, about as big around as a strand of hair. That high velocity jet then hits an impaction pin and it begins to form this uh, conical sheet. So you can see the clear water sheet there. And because it's conical as it expands away from the orifice, it gets thinner and thinner. And eventually the uh, aerodynamic forces of this rapidly moving sheet of water overcome the, uh, the uh, surface tension of the water and it shatters into small droplets. So there's a rather abrupt boundary there where the clear sheet suddenly shatters into small droplets. Uh, you can see this for yourself. If you took a glass of water up to a fifth floor balcony and tipped it off slowly, it would come out as big globules of water and then those would break up into finer, smaller droplets. And just before they reach the ground, they would go and shatter into a very, very fine mist. That's when this critical number, the Weber number, which is the drag force over the cohesion force, when that critical number is reached, water breaks up tr quite dramatically. Uh, starting in the early 2000s, we, we uh, began a pretty intensive R&D effort, basically trying to understand water atomization better. And uh, we bought a laser particle analyzer and we hired a physicist to operate it and uh, published a lot of papers and information about droplet sizing in particular. And uh, some of that eventually resulted in the ASME droplet measuring protocol, which is kind of the, uh, the protocol that's used today for measuring atomized sprays. And one of the things we learned is that you can distinguish just with your eyes between a very fine fog and a, and a mist. So the nozzle on the bottom shows is a swirl jet type nozzle, which produces a what you would consider a pretty fine mist, much finer than you would get from a Windex bottle, for example, but it's still not quite a fog. And you could tell the difference between the knee fog and paction pin nozzle at the top because the droplets here are so small that they're affected by micro turbulences. So it looks kind of smoky. It's also quite opaque and white whereas this misting nozzle has a more gray appearance to it. And you can see the uh, trajectory of the bigger droplets as they penetrate easily through the surrounding air. So that's the droplet size distribution. It's what's called a log normal distribution. So this is a log scale. These are the different droplet size bins. If you plotted that on a normal scale, it would have a big hump here and then a long tail so there are very many small droplets and a few larger ones. And this is an example of how you can improperly measure droplets. This is a uh, measurement 
given to one of our customers by a different nozzle manufacturer. And you can tell just by looking at it that it's incorrect because it doesn't follow that log normal distribution. This particular customer was looking for a lot of very small droplets. So probably what they did is they took their laser particle analyzer, they pointed at the part of the spray plume that has the smallest droplets and falsely made it appear that there were many uh, one micron and even submicron droplets. So our research allows us to kind of uh, see through those kind of ruses. <laughs> and uh, from that research, we developed charts like this that allow you to determine the, uh, the size of a droplet if you know the flow rate, the operating pressure, and the type of nozzle, so swirl jet or impaction pin. So often if a customer comes to us and says, a competitor says his droplet size is smaller than yours, we're able to show them on this chart and the papers that it came from that that can't really be true. And a lot of what we're doing is evaporating water. So if you wanted to cool a large mass of air, a fog system is a good way to accomplish that. And the reason for that is that there are very many, very small droplets and these droplets are spheres. So they have a high surface area to volume ratio. So the exposed surface area is very, very large. So a, a single mean nozzle produces about 6 billion droplets per second that are on average about 10 microns in diameter. So it's a huge exposed surface area of water. And uh, in researching a paper I wrote back in uh, 2014, I realized I don't really know how evaporation works. So I started reading up on it and I found this paper by this uh, Hungarian guy, one paper of the year award in 2012, I think it was, a guy named Gari, Garai. And he was the first, it turns out, in 2012 to be able to come up with a mathematical model that actually describes evaporation. Prior to that, no one quite understood how a water molecule that's excited by heat so that it's vibrating faster and faster as it's heated up, how a single molecule could get enough energy to escape the surface tension of the water. So the surface of water has a high surface tension because water droplets are dipoles. They have more charge on one side than on the other. So they're attracted to each other. The positive side of one is attracted to the, neg to the negative side of the other. And at the surface, because they have fewer neighbors, that charge is stronger than it is deep inside the fluid. So it creates this barrier and no one could quite figure out how these molecules could get enough energy to escape out of, uh, out of the surface tension. And Garai finally figured it out. And it has to do with this fact, when a single molecule actually below the surface, not part of the surface layer itself, gains enough energy from the simultaneous collision of all of its neighbors, that gives it sufficient energy to break through and, and break the uh, surface tension barrier. So I wasn't the only one who didn't understand evaporation. <laughs> it took until 2012 to really get a model that explained it well. So MEFOG system applications, there are many, many applications for our equipment. That's, that's a list of a few of them. Uh, many years ago, I counted, I defined a market as, as a, a market segment, as a sector that had its own trade shows and, and uh, trade journals, like the Journal of Horticulture or something like that. And uh, I counted 65 individual markets. I'm sure that number has grown substantially since then. So we do everything from uh, humidifying commercial buildings to humidifying industrial operations, textile mills, woodworking. So if you look around the room you're in, the, the leather on the chairs, the carpet on the floor, the uh, textiles you're wearing, many, many things are manufactured in, in high pressure fogging. Uh, even battery manufacturing, the Tesla uh, mega factory that makes batteries up by Reno, Nevada. 
has a BFOX system in it. Not sure exactly why, but they need humidity, I guess. Uh, airplanes and cars are painted in rooms that are humidified with me fog systems. Zoos and botanical gardens, movie making, even wine is aged in rooms that are humidified with, with fog systems. This is a typical humidification system. So there's a water treatment system, uh, typically reverse osmosis which is basically a, uh, the reverse of natural osmotic processes where water is forced through a membrane that has very small pores in it. Only the water molecules can get through and any minerals that are dissolved in the water are removed. So if you fog with water that has a lot of minerals in, in it, you can get a white dust forming on surfaces because the water, the water evaporates from the droplet and the dust particle falls to the surface. Or you can get, uh, like a line buildup like you see on your faucet at home if you don't have a softener. And then that's followed by a high pressure pump unit operating from 2000, 1000 to 2000 PSI. And then a staging panel, which is often mounted on the air handling unit itself. So it'll be a feed line connecting between the high pressure pump and the, and the valve panel. And then a manifold of nozzles that goes inside of the air handler itself. So these, these systems are quite popular on the East Coast uh, or in uh, Colorado or places like that where it gets very dry in the wintertime, basically because it's cold outside. So the water content of air is, is very low. When you heat that air up, it gets extremely dry inside. So we've humidified uh, everything from hospitals and schools to uh, laboratories and just pretty much any kind of commercial building. We also make a little uh, unit that we call the mini me, <laughs> named after the Austin Powers character, I guess. It's a smaller unit that's suitable for small air handlers or uh, uh, wine barrel storage rooms, which are sometimes quite small. So these are all industrial quality uh, equipment built to uh, UL certified 501A industrial uh, codes. So they're, they're not toys, they're intended as uh, industrial machines. Here's an example of another application we cool data centers. So data centers, this one happens to belong to Facebook. That big building there is basically full of computer servers all lined up in a row like a giant library, but uh, with computer servers instead of books. And the uh, penthouse of that building has 60 of these fog systems in it. So air is being brought in at the roof level and then forced down into the space between these uh, rows of computer servers. And that air has to be humidified and cooled. This site has uh, three buildings of this size and it contain, it consumes 30 megawatts of electricity. And virtually all of that gets converted to heat. So they have a lot of heat that they have to get rid of. And the fog system evaporative cooling helps them do that. So there's an example of it in operation. And that panel you see there at the end is a droplet filter. So we don't want to spray water on the computers. So we spray the water into the airstream. It quickly evaporates. Whatever doesn't evaporate is collected on that filter there and drained away. And in this case, it's recirculated back to the water tank it came from and reused again. Oops. That's a, a typical wine barrel storage room. So what happens when you're fermenting wine, the uh, water molecule is small enough to migrate through the oak barrel and then evaporate off the surface. And that means your wine gets concentrated and you end up with wine that has too high of a alcohol content when you're finished. So to avoid that, the uh, barrel storage areas are humidified. And we have uh, probably over 100 today installations, mostly in Napa, California and surrounding areas. 
uh, cake, bread, silver oak, pretty much all the big wine makers use our system. Uh, this is an example of a special effects fog system built for uh, Swiss Expo in Yverdon on Lake Neuchâtel in southern uh, Switzerland. This was built in 2000. It was part of the Arte Plage Swiss Expo. So different beaches on the lake had different uh, art exhibits. And this was conceived of by the architects Diller and Scafidio out of uh, New York City. And it was quite an interesting project. That structure you see there is about 600 feet long. It's a tensegrity structure. So it's, it's made up of uh, rigid members and cables and none of the rigid members actually come in contact with each other. So it's all kind of suspended on, on cables. It's a fascinating structure. That's a view of it from across the lake. I was actually on that site on 9-11 when we got the uh, call about the planes crashing in New York. And I had planned to come home the next week, but I couldn't travel. So I ended up stuck outside of the United States for 90 days. <laughs> I had to go to Asia and didn't have time to come home in between. Okay, gas turbine inlet air fogging. This is our major market. Probably 80% of our income comes from this market. A gas turbine is basically a jet engine like you'd find on the wing of an airplane, but they're used for power generation. And most of them today are built quite large. So that, that unit you see there could be 40 feet long. This uh, inlet where the air comes in could be 12 feet in diameter. And uh, it's basically an air breathing engine. So it suctions air in using this compressor section. Let me get a better pointer here. So these rows of blades here, it's basically a rotating machine. So it's, it's spinning around on this shaft. And usually that shaft is driving an electrical generator. So the compressor section has many rows of blades that compress the air to sometimes as much as 20 atmospheres pressure, 20 times what is normal atmosphere. And then fuel, normally natural gas is fed in and burned and that causes the air to want to expand. And so as it expands, it runs through this row of rows of, uh, of airfoils basically. And that causes the machine to spin. So the compressor is there to make it uh, more efficient because you have a higher pressure ratio you're working across and also to make it more compact. So you could just light a fire under a fan blade and it would turn that fan blade because the rising air would, would uh, cause the blade to turn. But to get very much energy out of that, you'd have to have a very big fire and a very big fan blade <laughs> so that the compressor allows you to uh, make a compact unit. So modern gas turbines can be on the order of uh, 760 horsepower. These are very big, very powerful machines. And typically when a gas turbine is ground-based, it has a inlet air duct and filter. And that's to protect the compressor from becoming fouled. That's not really a problem for an airplane because it's flying way up above atmospheric dust. And these machines on the ground operate, uh, sometimes they'll turn them on for as long as five years without ever turning it off. So they don't wanna to have to stop it and clean it. They wanna be able to keep it running. So our system has two applications here. One way, cool the inlet air, which makes it denser. And since the gas turbine itself is an air breathing machine, if you feed more air to it, it makes more power. And also the compressor gets more efficient if we go back to the compressor here, if this were a 100 megawatt turbine that produced 100 megawatts of shaft power, this expander section would be producing 200 megawatts of power and the compressor would be consuming 100 megawatts of that. So anything you can do to make the compressor more efficient makes the overall machine more efficient. And cooling the air does that. It takes less energy to compress cooler air. 
So the compressor consumes less of the power produced by the turbine. And another thing we do is kind of an intercooling effect where we, we spray water directly, we spray that fog directly into the inlet of the gas turbine. So as the air is compressed, it heats up. That's just a natural uh, phenomenon. If you've ever used a bicycle pump, you might notice it can get quite hot. The reason for that is you're compressing it and the, water, the air molecules are closer together and they get excited and produce heat. So you can reduce the work of compression, the work required to compress that air mass flow, if you can cool it incrementally as it's being compressed. As you compress air, it gets hotter. And as air gets hotter, it wants to expand, so it becomes harder to compress it. So you're, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle there. So if you can cool it uh, during the process of compression, you can get uh, quite a bit more power out of the gas turbine. So those are the two applications of fogging for gas turbines. That's a typical uh, nozzle array. So each one of these little nozzles has its own little spray plume. And there are sometimes several thousand of them across the inlet. They can be turned on and off in stages, which allows you to, to uh, control how much power output the gas turbine makes. So for example, you would run the gas turbine up to its base load output and then if you need more power, you would start adding stages of fogging. So it allows you to kind of follow the load. This is an example of a test of a fogging grid. If it'll play, there we go. So that's one quarter of the flow of a nozzle grid that would be installed in the inlet of a gas turbine. We couldn't turn the whole flow on because we don't have enough electricity in our factory to run all the pumps. But it produces a very thick cloud that in this case went up about 40 feet in the air. And again, that's just one quarter of the total flow. Uh, see if I can get it to play again. I guess not. We also built some uh, wet compression systems for General Electric, a manufacturer of gas turbines. And uh, being General Electric, they were quite sure they were smarter than we are. And they probably are, except when it comes to fogging. So they required that we use these uh, particular type of nozzle, which they thought would produce a better spray. And as you can see, it doesn't make anywhere near as much fog as ours did. And you can see, uh, rainbow in it. That means those droplets are bigger than 60 microns. You don't see a rainbow in cloud, you see a rainbow in rain. So those are basically approaching raindrop size. And the problem with that on a gas turbine is those compressor blades are moving quite quickly. These things are spinning at 3,600 3, revolutions per minute. So the airflow across them is just subsonic almost the speed of sound. So any droplets carried in that airflow are gonna impact on the blading of the compressor and could wear it out. And in fact, when a coarse spray is used, it does wear it out. And that's quite dangerous because if you eroded too much of the leading edge of one of these airfoils, it could break off and it basically just destroys the entire engine. It gets sucked inside and tears it apart. That's an artificial cloud. So for gas turbines, uh, we build these high pressure pump skids. That's a typical example of one. These are the motors that uh, drive the pumps. The pumps are underneath here. They're water lubricated uh, axial piston high pressure pumps. And this is an industrial com control computer inside of a electrical cabinet. So we build those in our factory, ship them to the job site, set them on a foundation, we run these uh, high pressure nozzle lines up into the inlet air duct of the gas turbine. There's several more examples. Another market we've gotten into recently is uh, the disinfecting market. We built this uh, portable unit. It basically has a water tank on it, so you can put a solution in it. 
you plug the pump into the wall for electricity and then it has this hose on it. And the advantage of it is because it has many nozzles, the orifice can be small, the particle size produced is quite small. So you can lay down a very thin film of disinfectant on the surface, thin enough that it, for a disinfectant, you have to coat the entire surface to make sure that you kill anything that's on it. But you don't want to have to come back and wipe up a big wet mess after you've done that. So this allows you to quickly lay down over a large area, a very thin film of, of uh, disinfectant. Uh, some potential applications. This is one that we worked on back in the early 80s, but never, uh, never commercialized. This is an aeroponic greenhouse that we built in our back parking lot many years ago now. So the plants are growing on this level here. And underneath, if you open these doors up, you see the roots. And the roots are in a fog of nutrients. So there's no soil used at all. And plant roots actually need air. Plants need air in order to grow. If you've ever overwatered a house plant and killed it, you, you learned that lesson. So they actually grow quite vigorously when they're exposed to, uh, to a lot of air. And every couple of years, this will come up again and someone will want to try it, but it's never quite been commercialized. Another uh, application we're working on is uh, CO2 scrubbing. So this will be removing CO2 from the exhaust gas stream of, for example, a gas turbine to uh, reduce the uh, amount of CO2 that mankind is emitting into the atmosphere. And the way that works is, uh, Basically, you just pass the exhaust gas through a thick fog of, of uh, very small droplets. It can be just pure water. And uh, CO2 will be absorbed into the water. And the amount that's absorbed depends on Henry's law, which tells you the ratio between the partial pressure of CO2 above the droplet surface and the concentration of CO2 in the droplet itself. So it will, uh, the CO2 will diffuse into the water droplet and uh, then you've captured it. Then you could take that water and pump it away to, for example, an agitation tank, agitate it so the CO2 will gas off again. And then you can capture it and bottle it and use it for different applications. And we've done uh, proposals for several, uh, several different, uh, projects where this technology was going to be uh, showcased, but uh, so far none of them have received any funding. So this is a patent that was uh, granted to a friend of mine, Sanjeev Jolly, for that technology. And he discovered several years ago, gosh, probably 10 years ago, that the amount of CO2 that he was collecting was more than Henry's law predicted. And Nobody really knows why that is, but uh, I think I do, but I can't tell you. <laughs> it's top secret. So there's an example of a, of a uh, 30 foot diameter absorber vessel. These would be all the fogging nozzles here. It had quite a high flow rate. It was several hundred gallons per minute. Yeah, 230 almost gallons per minute. So the exhaust gas from the gas turbine in this case was fed down this duct and then expanded into this reactor vessel. It had a minute or two of residence time in there with the fog droplets and then the droplets are collected on a filter, drained away and the CO2 was collected. So that's been done on a uh, laboratory level but it has never been done on a, on a big level but it does seem to hold promise as a potentially inexpensive method for capturing CO2. So that's pretty much all I had. I don't know if I used up all the time I was given, but uh, that's it. So I don't know, Darcy, did you have uh, anything in it that you were going to say? I don't recall. No, um, I'm here to answer questions and um, if anybody has any. <laughs>
One of the questions that has come up is from Jeanette. So let's talk about the disinfecting system. She's familiar with drones that do a similar job and she's wondering how your system compares to it, to the drones that do disinfectings. Yeah, I saw those videos on the drones. That's a really interesting concept. But uh, one person using our system can spray five gallons of water, which is about 50 pounds of water. It would take a very big drone to spray, to carry 50 pounds of water. So you could cover, for example, uh, I think the drone video I saw was in a sports arena. One person with our spray rig with that spray gun on it could walk at, at the beginning of a row of uh, seats, for example, and he can spray up 30 feet into that row of seats and just walk along and spray it all down. So in about six minutes, you can spray 50 gallons. Whereas with the drone, the drones I saw look like they might be carrying a quart of water. So it would have to run back and get a refill pretty frequently. Although you could have many of them. Yeah, it's a fascinating concept. Actually, as it turns out, the uh, Center for Disease Control originally thought that COVID was Potentially, that, that uh, surface contamination was a was a big source of uh, of spreading spreading COVID, but today they think that's probably not true. It's probably mostly airborne. So, well, I think I think the disinfecting concept is is piquing everyone's interest uh, given our COVID experience. Justine is is interested in knowing, and I think you just sort of addressed it to, in terms of. Is the spraying sufficient or do you have to wipe things away to deal with the, the fomite transmission? Yeah, there are many uh, chemicals that are approved by the EPA for specifically for COVID and other uh, viruses and bacteria and things like that, that uh, do not require wiping down. So you, you could spray it and allow it to evaporate naturally off the surface. And Alfredo's wondering if this is useful for schools and how can you tell if you are in fact covering all of the surfaces? Yeah. Well, you probably never cover all the surface because it's an imperfect world, <laughs> but uh, getting most of them would, would be the important thing. In particular surfaces that are touched often like desktops and doorknobs and stuff like that. And yes, we have sold units to schools. Oh. Wisconsin, one project, I, I, they came back and bought a second unit. Oh, very good. And what's the wear and tear on it? Uh, Mark is assuming that the pumps have some normal wear and tear, but what about the nozzles? The nozzles last a century forever. And these, these again are industrial grade uh, pumps under normal usage of maybe a couple of hours a day. They, they will last many years. We often get uh, emails from customers 25 years later saying, hey, can you help me? Something broke on this. They'll send the nameplate in maybe a couple of times a month. We'll yeah. So they're, they're still running. <laughs> After that long. Mm -hmm. I know, That's I tell them they should all be replaced within 10 years, but nobody listens. Tell us about the market space that you're in. Who are your biggest competitors? Well, it really depends on the market. For uh, HVAC humidification, which is kind of our second biggest market, it's companies like Dry Steam and uh, Condair, companies that originally built uh, steam type humidifiers. But when we came into the space with these direct evaporation humidifiers, they use a lot less energy. Our system uses about 1% as much energy as a steam system. So they, they were quite competitive. And uh, eventually these much larger companies than us that made these steam systems had to begin to compete with us. But we have uh, good name recognition and, and uh, good market penetration. So we, we continue to be able to compete effectively on that. And the how has the market changed with the, the COVID and the the uh, issues with disinfecting. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Hospitals and schools have been mandated to increase the amount of outside air that they bring in so that the air is fresher indoors. Normally you would turn the air over in a commercial building 10 times per hour. And now they wanna do that 20 times per hour. And again, if you're bringing in cold outside air, that air has to be humidified. So potentially the market for humidifiers could, could double. And were you creating the disinfectant sprayers before COVID? The no, portable we weren't. units? We were not. And I think we'll find other markets for it. We have some of our greenhouse customers. We do a lot of uh, greenhouse fogging for commercial greenhouse growers. Uh, some of them are testing it for spraying fungicides and mildicides and stuff like that. And again, do you have to uh, treat the, the solution essentially for to prevent microbial growth? No, because it's it's a biocide. <laughs> in a in a typical greenhouse fogging system where we're they're using it for evaporative cooling and humidification, if they're using a well water, we do have to inject chlorine to kill anaerobic bacteria that could foul the fog nozzles. And that sort of goes back into Jeanette asking about the aeroponic systems. Can you connect those with robotics, like for smart farming efforts? You certainly could, yeah. I had one company that was very interested in that, but uh, nothing came of it. Probably for aeroponics, it's not really necessary to have such a fine spray. You could really just spritz the roots with a sprinkler every couple of minutes, and that's quite a bit less expensive than a true fogging system. Are you anticipating that, with the uh, new money, certainly in California, that's being opening up, opened up to schools, that this might, the disinfectant strategies might be used more frequently? Is that a, a market to explore now for the educational systems? Yeah, that's a, that's a dream of ours. <laughs> <laughs> but so far it hasn't happened. <laughs> I think we've sold 50 units so far. But it's really difficult, uh, for example, to get market share on Google, to get actual hits on a website. It's a very, very crowded space by people with a whole lot more money than we have. So it's, it's difficult to, uh, to market it on the internet like that. So yeah. what we are, we are hoping to do is to find uh, local distributors, sales reps who would... Uh, actually take these units to a school and demonstrate it to them. Because when you see it in action, it's really, it's really quite dramatic. <laughs> this room I'm sitting in, we, we brought it in here and pulled the trigger on the gun and fogged the room up so you couldn't see the other side in, in like three seconds. It's an incredible amount of fog spray. Well, so we even... haven't talked much about special effects kinds of things. Uh, tell us more about that. Have you ever has this been used in a rose parade yes if... i don't think it has been used in a rose parade it, i think it has um fiesta floats i'm not sure which float they used it on or how they operated it but we did do a project years ago you're you're sitting right next door to one of our other presenters we've actually you know visited with the folks at fiesta parade floats so oh. And now everything is out there at Irwindale. So it's it's certainly a, a good place. Yeah. And and let's hope that we have a rose parade coming up. Yes. Yeah, now, now is the time to hit them up and start working on the designs. Hopefully not by Zoom, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we started with special effects at the World's Fair in Osaka in 1970. Um, within a year of that, probably, we did the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland and a bunch of other Disneyland rides. And we've done just thousands of them around the world. Rainforest cafes. Rainforest cafes. Oh, of course. Um, medieval times, the big arena, the knights come riding through a tunnel with come bursting out of fog. Bellagio in Las Vegas. They have a big, huge fountain, and, and part of the show involves 5,000 fog nozzles that rise up out of the water and put a big cloud over the lake. 
and, the, and it is bridges. beautiful that's one of the best installations in las vegas so yeah it is pretty you you've done well chris that, molding who's pretty. our more scientific kind of guy is wondering to, if it would be reasonable to use the CO2 capture methods to connect to the exhaust fans from underground automobile tunnels. And now you're you gonna have yeah. to probably patent that question for him. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bruce can help him with that. <laughs> Is that something that would work? Sure, it would. It can also scrub uh, particulate matter. We did a project for the Department of the Navy that had some exhaust air coming out of a secret building. They wouldn't tell us what it was and they needed to scrub the particulate matter out of that and filters plug quickly. So we designed a fog system that basically the, the water droplets agglomerate around these fine particles and then it's easier to capture the big water droplet and drain it away. And Justine thinks that you're also at Fantasmic at Disneyland. Is that right? That's right. All over Disneyland. Yeah. That's fantastic. And yeah, we've we done dust dust suppression systems. Um, Thomas, what what applications would fall under dust suppression? For uh, coal train, we did one. Not not the uh, artist, but an actual train that carries coal. <laughs> <laughs> so it brought the coal up to the power plant and opened a hopper door and the, and the coal falls down into a big pit. And then a whole bunch of coal dust come, comes billowing out. So we pointed fog nozzles down into that pit. When the train arrives at the station, the fog turns on and the, the uh, coal dust can't get past the fog, basically. It collects it and puts it back in the pit. Application would be odor abatement. <laughs> you spray odor control. We've done a lot of uh, trash transfer stations where they they bring in uh, the recyclable trash that we put out at the curb and they sort it to, to get the recyclables out of it. And uh, that can produce a lot of dust. So we control the dust in those facilities. And is it easily portable? I mean, if you were doing like a trade show that's only gonna be up in a giant facility for two or three days or the Super Bowl or something for a major event, is it, prohibitively expensive to bring in one of these systems or do you have them like in a production truck and you can just sort of drive it up for an event? Uh, we don't, but we could. We're <laughs> actually developing a small system that uh, specifically for that market for like party rentals and, and uh, events, that kind of thing. It's It'd be like, sort of like the mobile me, but without the water tank, you just hook it up to a hose and have a manifold of nozzles and create a cloud for an event. And, and do you have problems with water systems and using available water systems like that? I know you mentioned that there was a filtration system, but how do you keep highly mineralized water like we have around here uh, to, from clogging up the system? Yeah, for a short-term event, you'd probably just clean the nozzles after. Wouldn't be worth it to install a expensive water treatment system. Or you could put a water softener for a permanent installation. I had a little greenhouse in my backyard at the house I used to live at and had a little water softener because like you said, our water is has high mineral content. Certainly around here. And, and Amelia has mentioned that uh, for a lot, obviously you, you do the wine barrels, but also woodworking you know for bending wood and keeping that humidification going on like for fender guitars that's so is correct. that something that's used in that sort of industrial application yes many many installations for woodworking yeah fender guitars is a customer of ours that's exciting and uh, many furniture factories in the carolinas where they tend to be concentrated these days so wood changes dimension with humidity you yes, tell my back there. porch that because on rainy days like this, I can't open my back fence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Brenda, can I ask a question? Absolutely. You can um, open up it as much as you want. Yeah, so one, one uh, question I uh, wanted to ask is, I understand in your story, there's, there was a, in the company was founded in the 69 or 67, and then you uh, got some outside funding, and then you 
had to go bankrupt and then you went private again because we're partly business oriented with this presentation. I was hoping you could kind of go through that story and how it, it had a happy ending, but probably had some lot of hair pulling at, before that happened. Yeah, Darcy, would you like to tell that story? Um, you go ahead. I'll fill in if I have something. So the company was started in 67. It, it uh, became a public, publicly traded company within two years, I think it was. And that was to raise capital to start the business, basically. And so it was a public company for many years. In the early 1980s, uh, my father hired professional uh, managers and, and uh, raised a lot of venture capital. Uh, our president at the time, Ronald Reagan, had passed some laws that uh, gave favorable tax uh, treatment to people who would invest money in research and development. So we got some of that money, but uh, the company didn't really grow fast enough to be able to pay it back. And uh, it was not profitable. Eventually we kind of ran out of money <laughs> and we couldn't pay the uh, payroll taxes. And one day the marshal showed up at the front door and padlocked it, sent everyone home. <laughs> and Darcy was a bookkeeper at the time. I was a salesman. And she just sort of swept the uh, day's receipts, the checks that were on her desk into her purse and went out the door. <laughs> and we they used were already that. already in my purse. I was on the way to the bank. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I forgot they were there. <laughs> <laughs> so we used that, uh, that money to hire a bankruptcy attorney and put the company into Chapter 11. The IRS had to take the padlock off the door and give the company back to us. And we Mine spent seven... Professional managers. Pardon? I said, minus all the professional managers. Right. They had all left yeah. long before because probably because we couldn't pay them. <laughs> <laughs> so from 1987, Darcy and I took over running the company pretty much. Darcy ran finance and uh, production, and I ran sales and marketing and product development. And those continue to be our roles today. So uh, through the uh, late 80s and early 90s, we ran the company actually under receivership in what's called Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And eventually we filed a plan of reorganization and we were allowed to come out of bankruptcy. But some of the creditors at the time, particularly the creditor who had been our CPA and who represented the creditors committee really wanted the company. They didn't want their money back. They wanted the company. We couldn't give them their money back anyway. So they took the company as payment. So my father at the time had 60% of the shares of stock. And those were redistributed to the various creditors so that my father's share was diluted down to one and a half percent, was it? Yeah. Something very low. So for a year, the company was owned by others, but operated by us. They liked what we had done with the company, uh, taking it through bankruptcy and reorganizing it and getting it back on its feet. So they let us stay on as managers. And uh, Darcy and I made a deal that Darcy would go behind the scenes of the creditors committee and contact the actual creditors and see if they would be interested to sell their stock back to us at some kind of a discount. And meanwhile, the creditors themselves, the creditors committee had said, if you meet these goals over the next five years, we'll allow you to buy back 10% of the company each year. So as a way of incentivizing us to grow the company quickly. So I told Darcy that I would go out and make sure that we met that first year goal, which would allow us to buy 10% of the company back. And uh, we were both successful. Darcy was able to get creditors commit to commit to sell us just under 50% of the shares and we were able to grow the company sales enough that we could buy back that other 10%. And one beautiful day, we got to go before the creditors committee and tell them, guess what? We own more than 50% of the company. <laughs> and so they quickly agreed to sell us their shares back. And funding all that was difficult. We actually had to go to family, to our 
to our mother who mortgaged her house, that old house you saw in the pictures earlier, loaned the money to four of her five children, and they used that money to buy those shares of stock. And within uh, how many years did it take us to pay that back, Dars? Maybe four or five years, maybe, maybe less. Yeah, pretty quickly. We paid and it's it all back. Still a, it's still now all a family owned company, correct? Yeah, it's owned 50% by Darcy and I, 50% yeah. each. Some of the other family members sold. Our father passed away, we bought his stock. So is, was it, were they convertible notes? Is that, is, were they notes from the VCs instead of equity? Is that why you were forced to pay it back? Yeah, they were uh, convertible subordinated debentures, if I recall exactly. That, that's an, I think an, I'm, I'm a member of Passing Angels. It's kind of an important note. It doesn't happen very often, but you know, a company often will sell convertible debt, converts to equity, but if they run into trouble, all of a sudden they can't pay that back. If they don't raise the next round of equity that they hope to do, then there's potential that you end up having to pay back your, your convertible note holders. So it's quite common to do a convertible note round, but occasionally it causes trouble for the founders. Right. So it sounded like that kind of what happened here. Yeah, needless to say, Darcy and I stay very far away from any kind of venture capital, <laughs> having lived that. Well, with that kind of learning experience, one of the other questions that came up, you have quite a diverse market, so many diverse applications for the technology that you manufacture. It, um, Alfredo is wondering, how do you choose which products to follow up with? So many things can be used and so many different from yeah. industrial to entertaining. I call it riding to the sound of the guns. So if you're in the middle of a battle and you hear some gunfire over there, go that way. <laughs> Basically, we follow the money. And the, the product is essentially the same system, just bigger, smaller, configured differently. Yeah. But so we don't have to retool the shop. We just, it's a different marketing strategy. So, for example, our first gas turbine project was done with an engineer who had previously been uh, employed by a fountain company and went to work for a gas turbine engineering company. And one of his customers needed a better system for cooling. And he said, well, why can't you take that MEFOG system and apply it to a gas turbine? And that, that began a market that's been our 80% of our revenue for decades now. So is, are the gas turbines, is that how generally how you have a, a natural gas power plant? Is that basically what that's for? Yeah. Okay. They're gas turbines because the motive fluid, they call it, is, is air, which is a gas. But I but mean, they are typically... are they power plants that are using these or is it some other use? It's power plants. Yeah. Either public utilities or uh, independent power producers are called, which are becoming more and more popular. So and actually that market is kind of growing quickly now in large part because of renewables. So renewables need 100% backup because sometimes the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow at the same time. <laughs> so you have to be able to, as we learned in Texas, you have to be able to quickly back up it's eight renewable power. And gas turbines are a good way of doing that partly because they can be brought online very quickly relative to nuclear or coal. And they can be sited, uh, they're smaller, they typically are smaller power plants, maybe a thousand megawatt as compared to a 10,000 megawatt nuclear plant. So they're easier to site at different points around the grid. And they- I'm gonna ask, uh... Chris Molding to unmute. He's got some interesting thoughts about coal dust abatement and how it might be used in other mining operations. So Chris, are you there? There you go. When, um, Thomas, when you were talking about the, uh, um, the coal abatement uh, dust, the coal dust situation, it reminded me that many years ago, back in the 1970s, I worked in a mine in Climax, Colorado, which was 
uh, mining uh, molybdenum out of metamorphic rock. And whenever we blasted, we ended up with this very, very fine, um, very, very sharp pieces of silica. And so um, keeping the silica down was important. And they, they had various things to spray at the, which, which helped, but it really didn't help bring down the, the and I, I just, I don't even know whether sending a fog into that system after, after you blast would be at all helpful. But I'm just saying, in addition to coal dust, silica dust, um, is very damaging to the lungs, and a lot of the yeah. a lot of the miners I worked with had silicosis and and yeah. couldn't work past stage forty five or so. Isn't that the longest word in the English language? Numano ultra microscopic <laughs> silico volcanic oniosis. Whoa! <laughs> I didn't know that. I did only worked there about four months. I'm still okay. I think. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, when you want to capture a small particle, like a very small dust particle. If you spray it with a big coarse spray, uh, spray the, uh, the smaller dust particles just ride the boundary layer of air around the water. They never touch it. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever tried to spray uh, dust that you've kicked up in your garden, try to spray that out of the air with the garden hose, it doesn't work at all. But if you use a fog droplet that's moving relatively slowly, relative to the dust, it's small enough that the dust can't ride that boundary layer of air around it and it basically gets stuck to it. Well, I don't know whether the, the people at Cypress Amex Mines would be interested, but I don't know. I'm just saying it's, an, it's a potential opportunity because it seemed to me that we did, we knew that the, when we would see the dust coming at us after we blasted, that that, that was like, get your respirators on and see whether you can just sort of hunker down and not, and not take in too much of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we knew that sprayers would help a little, but they, they was a spray. So yeah. yeah. Anyway. Good application. Yeah. Leonard Possibly. is curious about uh, carbon dioxide collection and that that might go hand in hand with the natural gas turbines. Is that feasible? So Leonard, if you've got any follow-up, unmute and join in. Yeah, so it's definitely feasible. Um, as I said before, we have yet to get a demonstration project that, uh, that shows on a big scale how effective it can be. And that's sort of important because there'll be a lot of bugs to be worked out. But it, the fog technology is existing technology. It's been around for decades and we know, we know how to do it. So uh, it is feasible, whether it's cost effective or not depends really on whether there's a carbon tax or a surcharge on production of carbon or some other government incentive that incentivizes the capture. There are markets for CO2. Uh, CO2 injection into greenhouses is one of them. Carbonated beverages is another. So conceivably, you could uh, capture that CO2 and sell it to the market. But I don't think the economics would work out very well because it's a pretty expensive capture system. But it is a way of getting to net zero without uh, depending only on renewables. You could still have a zero emission fossil fuel plant. So we're uh, past eight o'clock. Are there any other burning questions before we uh, give the presenters a break and move to post presentation networking? Yeah, I, I, have one, I have one final question. This is uh, Sam Kurtz. Um, it's, it appears that they use fogging systems on aircraft, um, like in the plane. Or have you considered using a, you know, creating like a real sub miniaturized? version of this to be on aircraft in cabins? Yeah. So you might be referring to a phenomena that's uh, fairly common when you get on an airplane that's in a humid environment and it's been parked there with the doors open and then they but turn the airplane on. But yeah. They turn the airplane on and turn the air conditioning on and the cold air coming out of the air conditioning duct mixes with the warm moist air and makes a fog. It looks like a theatrical fog. 
that fills the cabin. <laughs> Many people find it alarming when they see it, but that's really just a natural phenomenon. Okay, but in so terms of fogging so for disinfectant, certainly we could we could do that. Wow, interesting. Thank you. We're working working with an Australian company on a system that would be permanently installed on trains for people transport, so that when it uh, Apparently trains go back to the main station twice a day, once at night, once in the middle of the day for uh, any servicing they need and cleaning. So there'd be a button on the outside of the car that the uh, service technician could push and the whole car would fill up, fill up with fog, with a disinfecting fog. And then it can go back on its scheduled route without any, any uh, labor being used to wipe it down again. So it would dry naturally. Okay, well, I wanted to thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, it was uh, amazing applications that uh, I never knew about. Um, and uh, and thank everyone for attending and Brenda for helping and and we'll move to, uh, to uh, if you can sign off now or join us afterwards for networking. So again, thanks. <laughs>